My brothers and sisters, while I have always been citing the greatest students and greatest companions of the Prophet wasallam, as they are the doorway to understanding Islam, constantly citing them throughout the various themes we speak about in Jumu'ah, I have for years consistently shied away from dedicating a khutbah to the greatest of them. And that is because I'm not sure it's even possible to speak about them in a khutbah. However, at the same time, I have decided to stop doing that because familiarizing ourselves with them is of the utmost importance. For a Muslim to be a Muslim and not know who Ali is radiallahu an, or Uthman is radiallahu an, or Umar is radiallahu an, or Abu Bakr is radiallahu an, is a gaping hole in our pathway to perceiving Islam correctly and being inspired to live Islam holistically. You know, I will spend these few minutes speaking about Umar himself, radiallahu an. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said if there was going to be a prophet after me, it would be Umar. If I were to recite to you just the ayat and the hadith that reference Umar alone, I would need khutbas. So I'll just stop there. If there was going to be a prophet after me, it would have been Umar radiallahu an. He is the one that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was shown his palace in particular among the ten that were promised Jannah of the Sahaba. In a well-known hadith, he was shown paradise. And he came across this glorious estate. And then this mansion, this palace, and he said, whose palace is this? The angel said to him, to a man from the Arabs, said, I'm Arab, whose palace is this? Eager for it to be his. They said, for a man from Quraysh. He said, I am Qurashi, I'm a Qurashite. Whose is it? They said, this belongs to a man from the Ummah, the nation of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, I am Muhammad himself. Is it mine? <laughs> he said, they said, this belongs to Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu an. And in some narrations that fill the picture for us, in Sahih al-Bukhari, authentic narration, he got closer and then he saw a beautiful woman washing up at a fountain outside. He says, so I turned back, remembering how jealous of a man you were, O Umar. So Umar wept and said, Ya Rasulullah, like this is my chance. Ya Rasulullah, I will be jealous about someone like you. We will accept anything from you. Umar was the greatest man in the history of Islam after Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's ummah, the second to none was Umar once you get past Abu Bakr radiallahu an, who was in a league of his own, of course. But Umar was actually second to none without exceptions whatsoever. When it came to being impactful in the world, he was the single greatest, most impactful Sahabi companion in Islam. And this is actually uh, of the ways that Umar's merits and virtue and biography are proofs for the truth of Islam, Islam being the true religion from Allah. And this can be appreciated from many angles. Umar as a proof of Islam. One is that this impact that he had that was so unique and so unprecedented and matched was foretold by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which meant that Allah was communicating to him. You see in one hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, Ibn Umar narrates radiallahu anhuma that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I was once shown a vision, a scene from the future. And I was shown that I had a handhold on a bucket and I was pulling from it for the people. And then when I finished, I handed it to Abu Bakr radiallahu an. And so he pulled one or two bucketfuls out of the well, but it was, he was struggling. And Allah will forgive him meaning it's not something to be held against him. And this was foretelling the fact that Abu Bakr would take the reins of the ummah and provide for this ummah its well-being. Water is the source of life, but he would not be able to do it for long. He was only around for one or two years. 
He says, and then Umar, in the vision he foretold, before any of this happened, he said, and then Umar took hold of the bucket, فَاسْتَحَالَتْ غَرْبًا And so this delu, this bucket, became like a huge tank. It wasn't a bucket anymore. To symbolize the exponential growth, the huge leap that would happen when this ummah was in the hands of Umar. He said, فَنَزَعَ نَزْعًا شَدِيدًا And he kept just pulling from the well, pulling from the well. فَمَا رَأَيْتُ عَبْقَرِيًّا يَفْرِ فَرِيَّهُ And I never saw anyone as skilled as Umar was in that moment. فَرُوِيَ النَّاسِ وَضَرَبُوا بِعَطًا And so everyone was able to drink from what Umar pulled. And they, ضَرَبُوا بِعَطًا means they pitched their tents, started building their homes, they settled down around the well. Because Umar was providing so well for them, so good. And this was foretelling the unique impact and the stability that would happen for this ummah at the hands of Umar. Ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda. Umar would benefit the ummah after Abu Bakr in a unique way. And stability would be had during his reign. All of that is of the proof of Islam. You know, even non-Muslims, when they look at this, they find it like a historical riddle. Like, how did this happen? You know, if you look into the history encyclopedia of Columbia University, the Columbia history of the world, they say this man, Umar, produced a superior government system to grow the ummah so well and so fast, like a centralized government, but he still had control over the, you know, the wider regions. The per they said he did all of this, but how? Like, they said it was a superior bureaucracy to the Roman Empire that's been around for hundreds of years. He pulled it off. And he had no interaction with them. He had no trial and error phase. He wasn't like the 15th or the 30th ruler. How did he do that? It's still a mystery until today to every honest, honest historian. And even if you look at you know, the famous book that Muslims love to speak on, the 100 greatest, you know, most influential. It's not whether he likes them or not. He's a non-Muslim author. He's not particularly you know, uh, biased towards Islam. No, he's not. And he put the Prophet ﷺ as the most influential man in human history. Who made the top 100? Number 52 is Umar ibn Khattab. He was a global personality, somehow, some way. And the Prophet ﷺ foretold that he would be. Another way that Umar is of the proofs of Islam is where Umar came from. Even among the Sahaba, even among the people of Quraysh, he was not at the forefront of what you would expect. And this shows you also the redemptive power of Islam. You know, maybe it won't be appropriate to say that Umar was heartless or an alcoholic. And sometimes, you know, some people have said this, but Umar was a regular drinker. And Umar was extremely aggressive. And that is why when one non-Muslim historian was like reflecting on his life, he said, this man Umar, the beginning he came from, you would expect that he would not have lived to see 30 years old. Forget help the world. Umar would have probably drank himself to death, they're saying. Or he would have picked a fight with the wrong person, because he's always getting into fights. And he probably wouldn't have even had a grave. He would probably just got killed on the side of a mountain somewhere by some revenge of some tribe, of some guy that he beat up. That's it. He would not have had a grave, let alone be able to lead the world. And this is for a lesson for all of us too. That many people in the world are captives of their past. And Islam comes to tell you, you don't have to be defined by your past. Don't take your negative self-image, how you see yourself, how pathetic or how powerless or how you know, sealed of a fate or how shallow your resource, whatever it may be. Don't project how you think of yourself, if it's so negative, on Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal has better plans for you. And your past does not have to determine and define your future. In a moment's notice, you can be ahead of the pack. You know, think about Umar again. Umar did not become Muslim early. He became Muslim about five or six years into the message. That means dozens and dozens of people were Muslim. Yet he outraced them all. He outdid them all. He got ahead of them all to become number two in the ummah, right? The pace, the lateness to the game, he missed out on some of the most difficult years of Islam. But somehow he got there. Because your Lord is Allah, your future does not have to be defined by your past. And so don't lie to yourself, don't sell yourself short. Remember the story of Umar always. It tells you what Islam can and will do for people. 
You know, e- even Banu Israel, Banu Israel, there's a well-known story that shows you uh, how well wishing your Lord is. People think, you know, Allah Azza wa Jal is all powerful, perfectly just, but he's indifferent. Like, you know, uh, sink or swim, I gave you the rules, gave you everything you need. I'm just here to make sure, you know, your exam gets graded. <laughs> no, Allah has a preference. The preference is that you be concealed and that your flaws be forgotten and that your sins be forgiven and that your soul be saved on the day of judgment. He prefers that. It's very clear. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala says, مَا يَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابِكُمْ إِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ وَآمَنْتُمْ What would Allah get out of punishing you? He doesn't want to punish. He will certainly punish some people, but he does not prefer that. He stacks the odds in your favor. Always remember that. And in a moment, all of it can be turned around. The story of Banu Israel that was coming to mind was that they say that Musa alayhi salam lived a stretch with Banu Israel, with his people, his tribe, in which they were all going to die from drought, no rain. And so they came out to the deserts all begging to Allah, showing their humility, give us rain, O Allah, please, O Allah, we're going to die here. And Allah finally revealed the reason to Musa alayhi salam after everybody felt the pinch that there is a man amongst you, O Musa, who's been confronting me for 40 years, challenging me with sins, with defiance. Tell him to leave from your midst, and then I'll give you rain. So Musa alayhi salam stands up and gives this sermon to Banu Israel. There is a man amongst you that has done so much wrong, shameless, consistently doing all this. At least don't kill us all. Let that be your one good deed to not be responsible for our death, our collective death. Just leave. Do us that. Just leave. And so this man knew it was him. And so he begged Allah Azza wa Jal in private to not humiliate him. Begged Allah to not expose him. Begged Allah to accept his apology, his repentance, and to turn to him in forgiveness. And without anybody leaving, the rain begins to fall. And so Musa alayhi salam says, Ya Allah, nobody left. I don't get it. What happened? And Allah Azza wa Jal reveals to Musa alayhi salam that the man turned to me with a sincere repentance and I've buried it all. Buried 40 years. He said, Ya Allah, allow me to meet this righteous servant. Oh, this guy's like a celebrity in the heavens. This is an amazing... Let me meet him. Show me this person. He said to him, Oh Musa, I concealed him for 40 years while he's defying me. The day we clean the slate, I'm going to expose him. He wishes not just to forgive, but to conceal as well. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, there's so much else to learn from Umar. Umar, you know, is the one that reminds us also to not be dogmatic, to not be uh, unrealistic in our understanding of the world. That we will not rise in deen until we also rise in our strength in this dunya. You know, they say we were never able to pray publicly. In those first five, six years, the persecution, the barrage they were going through, the violence, the torture, the murder, we were not able to pray publicly until Umar became Muslim. That is not strength in deen. That is strength in dunya, isn't it? The Prophet ﷺ was already there. He has great faith. Abu Bakr was there, great faith. So many of their great faith. But strength in dunya is also required to advance the cause of this great deen. And when Umar took reins of this ummah, that was his greatest complaint. That is in many different wordings that people would catch in his whispers, in his prayers, in his sujood, in his dua. He would say things along the lines of, Allahumma inni ashku ilayka min ajz al-thiqa wa min jaladat al-fajir. Oh Allah, I complain to you that I can't find the total package, basically. I complain to you, he said, from the incompetence of the trustworthy person. Good person fears Allah, but they're not good at it. And from the toughness, the endurance, the resilience, the hard work of the wicked person. Look at the person trying to lead the world astray. They work 18 hour days. Look at the people that actually have good hearts. They don't have the endurance, the stamina, the commitment. And so he would complain this to Allah till the end of his life. When he made that famous dua on his return from Hajj just before he was martyred, he laid down on the ground and he raised his hands to the sky and he said, Allahumma kabura sinni wa da'ufat quwati wa kathurat ra'iyati faqbidni ilayka ghayra mufarritin wala mudayya. Oh Allah, I've gotten very old. 
and my strength is starting to fail me. Strength. And my subjects, my responsibilities are getting so much. And I can't find help. So he says, so take me back before I mess up. Take me back before I too lead without strength. Alhamdulillah wahda wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiya ba'da Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa nabiyuhu wa rasuluh Also of the incredible, extraordinary qualities of Umar Is that he understood that strength was meaningless Until you're able to use it against yourself first Umar would wrestle with himself all the time in terms of his character, in terms of his God-fearingness. You know when you have great power, they say great power or absolute power corrupts absolutely. He was constantly fighting himself to not be corrupted by it, right? There is a very famous telling incident, I'll share with you quickly here and then I'll close out, that when he was on the verge of breaking the strongest oppressive regime, but the strongest regime bar none, and because they were oppressive, the Sassanid Persians, they said to him, there is a mastermind in this empire. He strategizes for them. If you're able to get him, you'll save a lot of lives and end a lot of heartache. His name was Al-Hurmuzan. And so when he was finally captured in one of the battles, Umar brings him forward to execute him. And then Al-Hurmuzan was a mastermind. And so he met Umar and he heard about the integrity of Umar. He said, he said to him, you Muslims say you don't torture prisoners. They said, yes. We give a painless death if needed, but we don't torture. He said, I'm tortured by my dehydration, my thirst right now. You're leaving me here without water. So Umar says, give him water. And so he sticks out his hand trembling like this. He's actually pretending. And he says to him, what's the matter? He said, you're probably tricking me and you're going to kill me even before I drink this water. So Umar promises him, that I will not kill you before you drink this water. So the man takes the water and spills it on the ground. Because now you can't kill me. You're a man of your word. And Umar conceded. He wanted to end the turmoil of the world, but he stopped. And he was a man of principle. And he turned that strength on himself. And Allah still gave him Persia. Still allowed him to liberate those lands and free its people. And allow the light of Islam to be shared there. The last thing I will say to you quickly about the biography of Umar is that if you can't be Umar, be Abu Bakr. And that sounds like a contradiction, <laughs> but it's not. Abu Bakr was the man who brought Umar to Islam. And therefore, everything Umar did, radiallahu an, was in the scale of Abu Bakr siddiq And there is so much, so much to be said here. But really, Assist the next Umar. Allah creates the likes of Umar for this Ummah in every generation. Give birth to the next Umar. Assist and develop the next Umar. Encourage the next Umar. Give shahada to the next Umar. Get out of the way of the next Umar. And don't sell yourself short. Look how great Allah is. Look how generous He is. Even though Umar was a unique personality, Abu Bakr still got all of his reward because of the great graciousness of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala azza wa jal. May Allah azza wa jal teach us and you that which benefits us and benefit us with that which he teaches us. May Allah azza wa jal be pleased with all of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, except from them everything that came of their efforts. And may Allah bless them uniquely for their sincerity. And may Allah gather us by our love for them in the highest ranks of Jannah with them. Allahumma ameen.